you so much for having me. Um, so Andrew Solomon did, did write the book this film is based on, and I, I think he started it in around the year 2000. And I started trying to figure out if this could be a film around 2013. And I don't think either Andrew in, in 2000 or me in 2013 would imagine we'd still be talking about this in 2019, but it is, it's really an honor to have so much interest in the film, and um, I, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. See you afterwards. Thank you, everybody. I'm thrilled that the film Live Far From the Tree is being shown in Iowa City. I have many dear friends and a wonderful lecture agent based in Iowa City. I'm delighted that the film is being seen in a cinema where it's possible for everyone to appreciate the complexity of the stories it tells and to see the beautiful cinematography on a big screen. Uh, when you're writing a book, what you need to do is find people to whom something interesting has happened and get them to recount it to you. When you're making a film, what you need to do is find people to whom something interesting is happening and follow them as it unfolds. I was very privileged to work on this film with Rachel Dretson and Jamila Efron. I was approached by more than 20 filmmakers after the book came out, and I chose Rachel and Jamila really because I thought that they understood the deep message of the book, its moral content, the complexity uh, of the story I was trying to tell, and it also had the ability to get the film made. And I thought they understood that a film had to be a very different medium for a book. In the book, I told the stories of more than 300 families. In the film, there are the stories of five. But nonetheless, through the great artistry that Rachel and Jamila brought to the process, the five that are there tell in many ways the moral content of the book and expose many of the elaborate conundrums and interesting questions that are posed by the text. So I'm thrilled that Jamila is with you tonight. She was one of the really major creative forces behind this process. I'm glad that you're getting to see the film and I'm only sorry that I'm unable to be there in person. Thank you so much. So I'm going to let Jennifer New from Associate Director of the Oberman Center, she's going to be leading the conversation. I'll let her introduce our guests. Um, but I do want to make one other little note. And Ben, are you good? Are we filming? Are we good? Awesome. Cool, cool. Um, I wanted to say one more note is that um, tonight's presentation is part of Science on Screen's National Night, which means there are like 30 theaters around the country who are also showing Science on Screen films and having conversations. So hopefully you feel a little bit of kinship to your fellow cinema goers tonight through that program. So anyway, I'm going to give it to Jennifer and she's going to introduce our guests and then we'll get this conversation started. Awesome. You guys can come up and sit down. <laughs> I feel like we need a, a science on cinema cheer or something. I don't know. Um, so first of all, before we all lose the like, just fresh buzz of this wonderful film, can we applause, uh, applaud our, our filmmaker? Yeah, no, it's it's a huge undertaking. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, so just uh, to give you a sense of who's up here with us tonight, um, first of all, I have the pleasure of doing this because I've gotten to work with Rebecca and a whole wonderful team of women um, for several months planning the Women's March um, programming. And I mean, Rebecca has done the brunt of the work and then we've all showed up and gone, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> Um, so, so that's why, why I'm here tonight. So um, Jamila Efron is the producer and co-director of Far From the Tree, and most recently she was co-director and producer of Woodstock, Three Days That Defined a Generation for American Experience. Ooh, I want to see that too. Um, her other work includes the Emmy and Peabody winning um, My Lie, The Assassination of, I oh, these are two different films. Yes, I was like, wow, that's really interesting, of my lie and the assassination of Abraham Lincoln and Clinton, each for the American Experience series on PBS, um, as well as Makers, Women Who Make America, and Cancer, based on the Pulitzer Prize winning book. Okay, all of the um, 
commas were taken out of this biography, hence my, my running this all together. So um, she also worked on the American Experience and Frontline co-production, The Mormons. Um, in the middle is Katie um, Tilosani. thank you my friend. Um, and Katie is the director, lead teacher, founder or co-founder um, of, a, of a wonderful independent school here in Iowa City called Purple Bloom School, um, which is located out in Coralville. And before Purple Bloom um, emerged, Katie owned and operated um, an in-home child care, including Purple Bloom Preschool, for 14 years. She spent that time studying the philosophies of Play Counts, Heather Shoemaker, Dr. Sinichi Suzuki, Handwriting Without Tears, Get for School, um, Yogi, uh, Reggio Emilia, etc. Um, Katie is a um, Suzuki violin teacher as well, a world traveler, and I've seen her in action with kids, and she has a magic, magical way with them, and so I really wanted her here tonight from that perspective. And then on the far end down there is um, uh, Eje uh, Demir Lira, who is an assistant uh, professor in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at the University of Iowa. Um, used to be called psychology. Every department at the University of Iowa, I think, is trying to make their names longer. It's, it's, it's a movement. So um, she received her PhD from the University of Chicago and completed her postdoctoral work at Northwestern University um, and has been in our, our fair city here for about a year and a half, you were saying? Second, second, okay, second semester. Her research examines why some children, often from disadvantaged backgrounds, fall behind their peers in academic achievement while others thrive. Her work combines behavioral methods that illuminate children's home experiences with neuroimaging measures that reveal the neurocognitive basis of children's academic performance. So, um, so thank you so much for being here. Um, I have asked um, both Katie and, um, Ajay, to reflect a little bit from their perspectives on the film. And then I was, I'm was i also hoping, Jamila, that you can tell us a little bit about how these particular families um, were selected. And uh, after, you know, this book with so, so many people in it. So why don't you reflect on, on that to us, and then, and then we'll just pass the microphone down. Uh, so we knew that we needed to sort of condense this ma massive 900-page book um, somehow. And we so we were sort of limited it to identities we felt were emblematic of the, the larger themes uh, that, that Andrew got at in the book. And we basically just tried to, to meet as many families as we could. I mean, we weren't – I'm not sure that we – we realized at the outset that we wanted autism, Down syndrome, dwarfism, crime to all be in the film. But um, as we started sort of meeting people, it, it, we realized that it wasn't just about about the stories themselves and the strength of the stories themselves. It was about the way that they would sort of interact with each other. Um, we, we knew that multiple character films are, are really challenging to, to pull off. And so we, we needed to find some natural intersections between them. Um, and so after meeting sort of hun hundreds of families, I would say, you know, there was something sort of self-selecting about the participants because we knew we were going to be filming for years and we needed a certain sort of buy-in from the participants uh, so they would let us follow them on these journeys. Uh, which were, you know, largely uncharted. We, Joe and Leah didn't know they were going to have a baby when we met them, um, and they agreed to be in the film. They were trying to adopt when we met them. So it was it was as much about sort of what people were willing to share as it was about this sort of vision we had. Um, that's, I think, the way it often is in documentary. You have this idea at the outset, but then reality sets in, and you sort of work with, with what unfolds and... and that actually had a lot, a lot to do with with who ended up on the screen. Well, first of all, yeah. So the question was, did we we search out families who had home movies? And the answer is no. 
um, which was a mistake. Um, but but we got really lucky with with Jack Allnut uh, for sure. Um, I, like without those home movies, I'm not sure that the story would have actually come together. And and probably seeing these home movies, especially seeing the sort of breakthrough moment that he had, um, I'm not sure that we would have ended up choosing to, to film with them. So yeah, a lot of, you know, we don't have home movies from, from most of the other families. And I think that with the Trevor story, we use literally every second of home movie that exists. But yeah, we, sh we should have, we should have, that would have maybe made it easier to cast the film, but no, it was a sort of a happy accident with All Nuts. First of all, that was really captivating and I'm really impressed that you were able to put into a picture what real life looks like because we have the Instagram world we have the Facebook world and it's fake it's not what it's really like to be a parent it's not what it's really like to be a family and one of the things that we work with at our school is trying to help kids have a happy healthy life and one of the ways to do that is to first of all identify that real life is real life and all of those families were all trying to do two things they were trying to meet the needs of their children and their inner child, and they were trying to find joy and happiness. And that's ultimately what all of us are trying to find, and I just think that you did a fantastic job of capturing what that's really like instead of what the Insta world says it's like, so thank you. Yeah, first of all, thank you again for uh, sharing this with us. It's so powerful, and I'm already thinking about how I can use this uh, in my teaching and my interactions uh, with students. Uh, and some of the questions that you raise, uh, some of the issues you raise are very powerful for me as a parent, but I guess I will uh, discuss as a scientist, as a developmental scientist, what resonated with me uh, and with what the literature is focusing on. Uh, one of the things that I think makes the movie very powerful is the focus on the parents and the children, and actually most of the movie was with the uh, parents, uh, and that's something that's... Uh gaining a lot of uh, emphasis in our research as well when we interact with kids who seem to have a typical abnormal trajectories the focus is now shifting to the er environment surrounding the child rather than just focusing on the child the interventions on the child how can we integrate the parents how can we focus on family as a unit so that was one of the things that resonated with me the most uh, another issue that was actually raised b by most of the parents is about um, the role of the parent, right? All the parents ask, and as a parent of a two-year-old, you ask this too, did I do something wrong? What did I do right? Did I do something wrong in the pregnancy? And so on. And this is again an emerging theme in our uh, field, the interaction between the parent and the child and the exact role of the parent. Uh, and there's a really nice book, uh, Carpenter and the Gardener, uh, by Alison Gopnik, a researcher in the University of California, Berkeley, suggesting that the role of the parent might not be the role of a carpenter, where you shape the child, but it might be more of a gardener, where you create an environment and uh, to a so that the child can bloom in the best condition. So those were, were really interesting to me. Thank you again uh, for this. Yeah, I was thinking of there's a Khalil Gibran poem of the your child your children, like they're not your children is is the essence of the poem. And do you have children? I do not. You do not. I okay. am someone's child. You are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and 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 how it, it how it maybe shifted your your sense of family in making this. I think that what's sort of universal is th that you sort of expectations are always confounded and this was sort of that experience writ large but you know I think we've all felt very different from our parents at moments certainly I have um, and th I think what making the film made me realize was like was the, the, that feeling of um, the love the love that I have with my family it was not necessarily <laughs> easy just because I look like them. It, I mean, I, I know that it's always hard one. It's always a, a struggle to sort of navigate the differences within a family. And, and I was also struck by the um, Jack, the, the tantrums of actually having been at, 
at school and in multiple schools and seeing kids have tantrums and you know my own kids have tantrums when they were little and that sense of that communication and so when he was able to like break through and say something is such an amazing moment and I was sitting next to you Katie and I was just wondering as an educator who's with you know, little folks every day, some of whom are having a, a hard time, your your take on that moment and that sense in the film. So, yeah, I get to witness some of that firsthand. And something I've realized in the last year, and this film really did a good job of starting to plant that seed in all of our minds that are able to see it, um, is that there's a different kind of child being born. The children that are on the earth now and the children that were children when I was little are different. There's something different. We can't identify what it is. We don't know why, et cetera, but there's something that's different. And him showing his tantrum is showing that he's dealing with stimuli in a different way. So it's not a way we're used to seeing, so it's not a way that we think is right or okay but that's how he's processing it. And so one thing I loved about all of the people in this film, it showed that it's the beginning of us changing our environment rather than changing the children. Because the children are the way that the children are. That he reacts to stimuli that way and it was so powerful in the film when the mom, you could just see her relax. Like she let go of trying to be responsible for his reaction to the stimuli and the sound and whatever it was, instead of her trying to stop him and control him, it was just like, I'm not taking this on, I'm just allowing it, it is what it is. And be seeing that in there, I think will speak to so many parents who are in that place of struggle where they don't know what to do because they're still blaming themselves and their child is still reacting that way. And it, it really is almost an invitation to start seeing it in a new light that instead of trying to change the child, we give the child coping skills, but we also think about changing changing the environment to meet their needs. That's just what I was thinking about when I was watching that part. And so if there are questions from the, the audience, I know we already had had one, but if there are others, we can we can take those or we can continue to chat. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm going to have to repeat everything for the filming, so. Do you still um, uh, have contact with the families in the film? I do, um, actually with, with all of them for the most part. Um, Joe and Leah just had their second baby last summer, um, a boy. And uh, the Three Musketeers really love to use FaceTime. So they're <laughs> blowing up my phone pretty consistently. Um, and uh, Derek and Lisa, uh, Reese, and they're they're in Texas, and they're they're still in touch. They're this was the I think the hardest for them to participate in, just because they were still sort of in hiding. They had not really spoken with even friends about what had happened. So this was a really big risk for them, and I think they did it because they wanted um, they wanted to sort of reach out to other families that had been in similar situations. And so I occasionally get an update about a family that's reached out to them. Um, and certainly uh, the All Nuts are lovely. I mean, we're, social media makes it very easy to stay in touch. So we, we have a nice network. And when the film premiered um, in New York, it, we actually were able to bring all of the families together for the event. And so all these people who we'd been spending years filming with who didn't know each other at all were all together for the first time. And it was really just a one, once in a lifetime, really magical, ma magical evening. And because he allowed himself to be part of the film, um, I assume that you're still in touch with Andrew Solomon, and I'm curious what he's working on now. That um, is a, you know, we are in touch with Andrew Solomon about the film a lot, but I'm not sure I'm up to the minute on what he's working on now. I know he was working on a, a podcast about family, um, but I'm sure he's he's writing a book as well. I just couldn't tell you what it is. And, and basically, I want his library. That was on the with the ladder. That was amazing. Other questions? Oh yes. The 
the question is about Trevor's siblings. Um, so, so Trevor's siblings, I don't think are necessarily working in in anything that would help them process tragedy. Uh, uh, his brother is a scientist. He's in college right now, um, working on some sort of like neuroscience, I think, or physics. I'm, I'm not sure exactly. And then his sister just went to college, so um, I'm not sure what her major is. But they're, you know, they're living their lives, and they're sort of they seem to be doing pretty well, and they're gorgeous, really confident, sort of lovely people that I think will, you know, be very, they'll be very successful in their lives that, and their parents are incredibly supportive and involved in their lives as well. Um, right here. Did you, try to uh, did you try to interview Trevor? So we spoke to Trevor by phone several times. Um, we didn't actually, we, we thought about seeking an interview with Trevor in Angola. There were a lot of reasons why we sort of let go of that idea. One was that there was a new warden at Angola. He was kept on death row for his own protection because it's just strict isolation. Um, and his parents were very concerned that us coming in with cameras would somehow rock the boat and then sort of ruin his life in prison. Um, it was also that, you know, we didn't want this to be about why he did it. We wanted it to be about the parents' experience of sort of grappling with this child they loved who had done something so unthinkable. Um, we, you know, I, I sort of regret that we didn't get in there to film with him, um, but I don't think he, I don't actually think he would have necessarily told us that much that we didn't get from from just filming with the rest of the family. Yeah. Uh, other storylines that didn't make it into the film. So we we did film with two families that did not make it into the film. Um, one was another Down syndrome story. A, a nineteen year old boy who and was raised by a single mother and it, he's a lovely guy and the story was was basically finished we, we shot it all and it just sort of didn't um speak with the other stories it didn't sort of the thematically there wasn't enough intersection with all the the other points that we were making with the other stories and then we filmed um a story about multiple severe disabilities a, a four-year-old girl who was blind deaf um she was sort of unable to speak um, and she had a sort of ter she had a terminal condition so sh they the parents knew she wasn't gonna have a long life she ended up dying while we were filming and we did f we were there filming for her last moments um, and it it was a really powerful story that I think could be a, a beautiful short uh, it just sort of it's such an intense story it kind of sucks all the air out and it sort of didn't play with identity the way that the rest of the stories in the film did. So we had to, to let that one go. But I would love to, to find a home for that one. Um, I'd also asked if either of you might have questions for Jamila. To yeah? Uh, I guess I was just curious, why did you uh, pick this book and approach Andrew Solomon? What was of interest to you? Uh so the director, Rachel Dretzen, actually, she went to college with Andrew at Yale. Um, they didn't know each other that well. They, they were sort of a few years apart. But she read the review. And she's a parent. She has three kids. And she, she was just blown away by the review and thought this has to be a film or a series. Um, so she approached Andrew. Um, I think it's it sort of spoke all the possibilities, the storytelling possibilities are just so in there. And you know we could be making. We could make like 10 sequels to this one. There's every family has a story. So I think the filmmaker in her, that was what drew her to it. Um, and then I, I've worked with Rachel for years, so I want it in. It's, it's such a treat to do this kind of, of filmmaking and getting to know families and sort of going on journeys that you don't, you don't know how they're going to end. So that was, that was why I got involved. Oh, thank you. 
did you have any aha moments or any perspective shifts while you were involved in this project about any of the children or any of the families or anything or yourself or your own childhood or um i think the thing that changed me is i don't look at difference the same way anymore you know i think that there might uh, there there was probably a discomfort in me with difference like an, uh, i would want to avert my eyes maybe and now i'm sort of drawn to it i'm interested in people who are different i'm and i'm comfortable talking about difference in a way that i wasn't before and certainly um th i remember the first time i went to the little people of america conference uh we went without cameras we were sort of we were under a lot of suspicion there were a lot of people who did not want us there and we went basically to kind of get their blessing to come back and film the next year. And after the first few meetings of just, I, I felt, I remember, so blown away that I'd ever kind of thought of dwarfs as this sort of monolithic group. They're all so different. They're, there's so much power and I think courage in having walked through the world with difference that I left that day just uh, totally changed. and sort of intimidated <laughs> and awed by them. And Joe and Leah are people to this day that I, I think of as, as friends. And certainly, like, if I ever say the wrong thing, they call me on it. I'm always sort of know that, that there's a bar that, that I have to live up to. And that I, I totally was changed by that. And Jack Allnut, too. The way that Jack Allnut looks into your eyes is, s it really is so powerful. It, like, made me see that there's just so much beneath, beneath the surface that you just can't judge a book by its cover. You just can't. I, I love that part where his, um, the facilitator at school said to the other kid, like, are you getting all A's? He's getting all A's. That yeah, yeah. And, and I was curious partly because I'm thinking of the science on screen, but it, um, were there, um, folks from the sciences, you know, researchers, experts, whatever, who were informing this film behind the scenes but just weren't on camera? Or is that something you just chose not to involve those voices at all or their input? Well, there, there were s certain elements of it. I mean, each story is so different. So with dwarfism, there was this big uh, movement to develop a drug to, to cure achondroplasia, to treat achondroplasia. So we definitely needed to, to like explore the science of that. And autism also, There's there were so many different schools of thought about how to treat autism, what the various therapies are. We met with loads of experts and um, facilitated communication, which is ultimately the communication method that Jack began to use, is incredibly controversial. And there's a lot of science on that. And so we, we, you know, we, we dug into that quite a bit. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that on a case-by-case -case basis, yes, but there, w there wasn't sort of a global scientist that was working on the film with us. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You're allowed. Um, uses of the the film in in classes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I when I saw it, I just started thinking about it. But of uh, one way, uh, I think for our students to better engage with the material and theories is to see uh, real uh, examples, right? To engage them, to uh, to be able for them to elaborate on this. So. I mean, there are, I think, multiple ways we can use this. It can be a part of the syllabus, like different parts can be discussed in different weeks. They can choose to write their research papers about this. So, yeah, I'll get back to you on that after I think about it <laughs> a little bit more. <laughs> well, I know we have a, a big educational distribution um, for the film, and I'm, I'm, I haven't actually heard a lot of feedback since it's been out there, but but I can tell you that the, the most powerful thing I've heard from people who've seen it are educators who work in medical schools 
um, because I know that the doctors are often like the first point of contact for parents when they learn their child is profoundly different from them and that experience colors them for the rest of their lives. So like Emily Kingsley said that the doctors told her Jason was a mongoloid. That is something she has never forgotten. Um, and so I think watching doctors and certainly medic medical educators take this film in and say, okay, there's, there's a lesson here. That is, for me, the, the, what hits home the most and, and what I sort of I hope gets a, out it there. Yeah, that seems very true. And also, given that you've distilled a 900-page book and anybody who's creating a syllabus for a class is like, oh, there's a film. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my son just went on spring break with Fahrenheit 451 and he says, is there a film? And I was like, no, read the book. Yeah. Any other questions? And then, yeah, one or two more. Yeah, way, way in the back. So Jason was, was filmed, I think that scene was filmed in 2015. Um, so he was 41 then, which means he's going to be 45 this year. Oh my goodness. Time flies. Um, I th I'm pretty sure that the people with Down syndrome are now living um, into their late 50s, 60s these days um, and longer. So, you know... I, he doesn't seem to be to be slowing down so much yet, and he's lost a bunch of weight, and he he looks great the last time I saw him. Yeah, th that's something all of these parents, well, Joe and Leah aside, really seem to be thinking about. Um, the all nuts, it's like their worst nightmare that they'll they'll die without a great plan in place for Jack. Um, even Trevor's parents, they they're you know, they're already preparing their other kids to sort of take care of him, visit him in prison, make sure to call, make sure to send him money, make sure to do all the things that you need to do when you have a loved one in jail. Um, it's, yeah, it's something they all, it, it sort of drives all of them. Any final question? All right. Well, thank you so much, all of you. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you.